On the 26th of July 2019, the Hanoverische Allgemeine Zeitung broke a story that suggested we may have misunderstood what caused the Reichstag fire of the 27th of May 1933. Initially, it was believed by many to have been caused by the Nazis as an excuse to declare a state of emergency. Later, blame switched to Marinus van der Lube as the lone perpetrator who caused a fire which the Nazis then exploited for their own purposes in order to curtail civil rights. However, the new evidence published in the Hanoverische Allgemeine Zeitung could suggest the initial theory may have been the correct one. On the evening of the 27th of February 1933, Four weeks after Hitler was appointed Chancellor, a fire broke out in the Reichstag. Here is a news report from the following day. Fire broke out in the Reichstag shortly after nine in the evening and burned so fiercely that within an hour the main hall in which representatives of the German people meet when Parliament is in session was completely destroyed. Flames leaping from the great glass dome surmounting the building could be seen for miles around and attracted huge crowds to the scene. Police in full force on horseback and on foot kept the crowd back while all the fire brigades in Berlin poured water onto the flames. High ladders were run up the walls and illuminated by searchlights. It is believed says an exchange Berlin telegram, that the fire was due to arson as it commenced at five or six different points simultaneously. A man was arrested in the building. He was found clad only in trousers. A Reuter telegram says that the fire was started by documents which were set alight in six different places. Apart from the man arrested, there were several other people in the building, although the Reichstag is not in session. The wildest rumours were circulating last night, adds Reuter. One was that secret orders had been issued to Nazi stormtroopers to create a Bartholomew night, when all opponents known to the Nazis were to be disposed of. Although the police asserted that communists are responsible, some people think that the fire may have been started by irresponsible Nazis with the object of provoking trouble. The fires were extinguished at 10.45 in the evening. The session hall presents a scene of desolation with all the deputies' seats, public and press galleries destroyed. The police, suspecting the conflagration to be the first of a series of communist acts of terrorism, have arrested a number of communist leaders. A Dutchman named Van der Lube, aged 24, is said to have confessed that he started the fire, but denied that he was acting as anyone's agent. The police found a rag steeped in petrol as they entered the building and the arrested man's cap was found close to other firing material. Her Hitler, Her Göring, Her von Papen and other prominent persons entered the building whilst it was still burning and Her Göring, President of the Reichstag and Commissarial Minister for the Interior in Prussia, took command of the police. Now that was what was believed at the time. That report dates from the following day. So, more details came out later and that's what we're going to examine right now. As pointed out in the aforementioned article, a number of Nazis were nearby and turned up at the scene of the conflagration. On arrival, Hermann Goering appeared to have the game plan already worked out. He loudly exclaimed, this is the beginning of the communist uprising. They will start now. Not a minute is to be wasted. And not a minute was wasted in rounding up people who were opposed to National Socialism. At the Nuremberg trial, Goering denied having caused the Reichstag fire, although within his own circles during the war he had claimed responsibility. Goebbels is also assumed to have been involved with the arson. On the 27th of February 1933, in the evening he was at home in the western part of Berlin, dining with Hitler. 
this was quite common. Hitler then did not have a home in Berlin, so he used to go around to the Goebbels' place quite often. During dinner, Ernst Hefenstangel rang and said that the Reichstag was burning and then Goebbels and Hitler drove very quickly to the building. What is suspicious is that despite the general election slated for the following week, Hitler, Goering and Goebbels were all conveniently in Berlin at the same time. Suspicious note, I didn't say that that is proof. On the 15th of February 1933, Admiral Magnus von Levetsov, who had been a Nazi member of parliament since January 1931, was appointed head of the Berlin police. He replaced lawyer and DVP party member Kurt Melcher. Von Levitsov got to work immediately arranging several searches of Communist Party officers, something his predecessor probably would not have done. On the 24th of February 1933, the Communist HQ was again searched and two days later, the government news agency Conti said that it would be releasing information on the, and I quote, sinister finds that were made in the bowels of the building, thus hinting that the Communists had tried to hide plans relating to a coup or revolution. The Nazi newspaper De Angri promised in its 1st of March 1933 edition to publish the evidence that it had found with all haste, but that was never done. And now, 88 years later, I don't think they're going to do it. On the 25th of February, an arson attack was made on the old Imperial Palace, which was extinguished. However, contemporary newspapers show a number of arson attacks were made throughout the country and all were blamed on the communists. Given that the official line was that this was the beginning of a communist revolution, one might have expected the police or the army to be on standby, but this did not happen. At the time, it was widely believed that the arsonists had entered the Reichstag through the subterranean passage that connects it with the speaker's residence, and the speaker was then Goering. The day after the fire, the Reich President's decree for the protection of the people and the state followed, with which the basic rights from the Weimar Constitution were suspended, and the legal persecution of political opponents was practically no longer subject to any limits whatsoever. As we now know, this was the beginning of the dictatorship. It led directly to the fraudulent elections of the following month, which in turn led to the Enabling Act. In Berlin alone, well over 1,000 Communist Party members were arrested on the night of the fire. Also arrested were Social Democrats and others opposed to National Socialism. As far as I can tell, not a single one knew anything about the origin of the conflagration. Five people were put on trial for the fire, four were acquitted and one found guilty. This was Marina van der Lübe, a labourer from the Netherlands who had been a member of the Communist Party as a teenager. Van der Lübe had suffered an industrial accident with Lyme in the 1920s which left him with less than 20% of his sight in both eyes. His industrial compensation was not enough to live off and he was unable to get anything other than temporary jobs. He spent some time travelling, trying to get into the Soviet Union twice and failing both times. He arrived in Berlin nine days before the fire and spent time with friends from the far left. For the Nazis, van der Lübe was the perfect scapegoat. He was arrested at the scene of the fire, he had threatened to start a fire, he was a communist and he was a foreigner. He was tried in Leipzig, sentenced to death and executed on the 10th of January 1934 by guillotine thanks to a law which was passed after the fire, in time it was accepted by most historians that whereas the Nazis turned the burning of the Reichstag to their advantage, this was in fact the work of one sole person and was done without the knowledge of the National Socialist leadership. 
In 1955, an affidavit was sworn by former SA man Hans Martin Lennings. He declared that in the late afternoon of the 27th of February 1933, on the orders of SA leader Karl Ernst, he went to a garden restaurant called Schwarze Katze or Schwarze Katzen in Berlin Marlsdorf. Two other SA men, whom Lennings did not want to name, were also there. They met Max Becker, who had previously been a member of the Communist Red Front Fighters League and now served as a police spy. He told the three SA men to pick up a man from the SA hospital in Lützowstrasse and bring him to the Reichstag, a journey of less than one kilometre. When he saw the newspapers later, he realised that his passenger was Marinus van der Lübe. This journey took place between 8 and 9 in the evening. On arrival, they noticed that there was a peculiar burning smell and that faint puffs of smoke also wafted through the rooms. Lennings was born in 1904 in what is now Wuppertal and as a child lived in Hanover. He was involved with the far right from the mid-1920s and he knew Ernst Röhm. After being hospitalised in 1930 following a street fight, he was visited by Hitler. He was arrested during the 1930s, spent time in prison for anti-Nazi comments. He died in 1962. He claimed that he made his affidavit on the advice of a priest and that his declaration was drafted by a notary in 1955 to be used in any potential retrial of Marinus van der Lübe. After the Reichstag fire, he and his comrades protested against van der Lübe's arrest because van der Lübe could not possibly have been the arsonist since the building was already on fire when they arrived. According to Lennings, those in the car were taken into protective custody and had to sign a declaration that they knew nothing about the fire. He was released on the orders of Ernst Röhm. Once more, according to Lennings, almost everyone was later shot who had belonged to the inner circle of those involved in the Reichstag fire. He was warned and fled to Czechoslovakia, returning to Germany later. Unfortunately, we do not have the names of the other people who were in the car at the time. However, many SA were killed during the Night of the Long Knives the following year, such as Karl Ernst, the person who had ordered him to go to the restaurant. A number of experts have said that van der Lübe could not have caused the conflagration with a few firelighters. It is also hard to believe that somebody who was as visually impaired as he was could have negotiated the five meter high balustrade to get into the Reichstag, passing through a window which was also surrounded by a two meter deep trench that was secured with barbed wire. This window, we can see in the photograph, is the one often said to have been the one he climbed through, but that is not the case. This is where the firefighters gained entry. According to his testimony, he got through the window to our right of this one, and I was unable to locate a photograph of that one. In fact, I haven't been the only person to look for it. Other people have failed too. Based on his own description, entry via a door, conveniently open, seems to be more likely. He had four fire lighters which he claims to have used en route to the debating chamber. At the debating chamber, he said that he used his jacket to set the velvet curtains alight. He did all this within 15 minutes in a building he had never been in before. During questioning and at his trial, he was quite apathetic to the consequences and suggestion has been made that he was drugged. He could have accepted sole responsibility, of course, as an act of bravado to encourage German workers to resist the Nazis. However, there are other holes in Lenin's argument. 
There is no record of a garden restaurant where he claims to have received his instructions with a name similar to Schwarzer Katter or Schwarzer Katzen in Berlin Marlsdorf. Furthermore, van der Lübe was not taken by car to the Reichstag but walked there around midday and then hung around waiting for night to fall and there are several witnesses to this. On the other hand, several witnesses did see a car of the type Lennings could have used parked at the Reichstag entrance which could have been used for entry. Could he have picked up someone else and later got him confused with van der Lübe? In 1936-1937, two doctors prepared psychiatric reports on Lennings on behalf of the Heredity Health Court at the Leipzig District Court, which designated him a psychopath, suffering from anxiety disorders, epilepsy and memory loss. This report was carried out with a view to possible sterilisation of somebody suffering from mental illness. An analysis in late 2019 of these findings by psychiatrist Frank Schneider for the German magazine Der Spiegel concluded that Lenning's statements cannot be dismissed as lies in principle, but there's a lot of evidence that he accused himself of an act in which he was not involved. Now, in my own opinion, and I could well be wrong, is that van der Lübe was put up to this uh, by a Nazi agent who had infiltrated the communist circle of the Dutchman and the Nazis had previously ensured that the building would go up in flames appropriately once the fire lighters were used. Max Becker, for example, who allegedly met Lennings, was a police agent and had been a communist. White phosphorus and oil residue were found in the Reichstag chamber and that, I believe, was the reason for the fire. I'm thus suggesting a possible conspiracy. Nonetheless, most historians continue to believe that Marinus van der Lübe acted alone. This story, I think, is not finished. More information will come forward and more theories will be suggested. Answers could be given to some of the questions asked here, and I think that this is a subject I could return to at a later date, but I'm absolutely certain others will return to it very soon. Thank you very much for listening. If you found this of interest, then you might want to subscribe. I put up a longer video every Friday night, and I put up shorter ones in the meantime, and sometimes I put up a longer video during other days as well. Thank you.